And uh, this morning we'll be talking about um, formable um, carbon steels, um, which are mainly produced um, combination of um, hot strip mill and cold strip mill and then annealing. Um, depending on how they're processed, these materials are processed, um, we, we generally divide them in um, two groups. Uh, the aluminum killed low carbon steels and, and then interstitial uh, free steels. And then we also have, we'll discuss this later on, a number of um, high strength steels, which, which are usually referred to as advanced high strength steels, which have a slightly more complicated microstructure. And, and we'll say a few words about this class of steels, DP steels, trip steels, and complex phase steels. Um, but we'll first discuss the aluminum killed low carbon steels and the IF steels. And uh, these are processed, as I said, uh, via uh, hot rolling and cold rolling. And they're basically um, s uh, slight differences uh, depending on how you, um, whether you batch anneal them or you continuous anneal them. And so the uh, um, IF steels can, can also be batch annealed or continuous annealed. Yes. Very often, uh, certainly in, um, in uh, applications, for instance, such as automotive applications, um, these steels end up being galvanized. Yes. And so um, if you batch anneal them, they usually end up being electro galvanized. Yeah. Um, and um, the continuous annealing that you would use if the product has to be uh, galvanized, you would apply hot dip galvanizing instead of the continuous galvanizing. And we've seen why that is. That is because um, in the uh, hot dip galvanizing line, you can do two things at the same time, recrystallization annealing and the um, um, coating application. In the case of these, uh, what we call advanced high strength steels, there's a little bit of a um, uh, challenge here. Is it's difficult to make these uh, steels because of their complex microstructures in a batch annealing furnace. So you basically require continuous annealing um, processing of these grades to actually make uh, the required microstructure. And that's the reason why we call them advanced high strength steels. The basic, uh, uh, we'll see that the basic uh, grades, aluminum killed uh, low carbon steels and IF steels, are, are very soft steels and that uh, we will use uh, uh, methods to increase their, uh, their strength. Yes. So strength increase for these. Of course, um, this group of steels is our high strength steel. So um, the, the, the method the methods we will use to increase the strength will include solid solution hardening, with, of course, manganese, silicon, but also phosphorus. Yeah. Um, grain size, reduction of the grain size, yes. 
will be uh, the main ways in which we do the strengthening. Uh, increase the strength of these, uh, of these steels, we'll see. And then um, there is also uh, a, a group of steels which we call bake hardening steels, bake hardenable steel, or BH steels, yes, where we use uh, static strain aging, it's called static strain aging, to, uh, to do the, the hardening. All right, so let's, uh, it's a short overview here. Let's go through um, the material. Uh, there's a lot of material. Um, some of it are, are repeats of what you've already seen, so we'll go um, relatively quick because the concepts now, I assume, uh, you know them well. All right, so um, important here is uh, that, for instance, when uh, these steels are applied, very widely applied in um, constructions of um, cars, for instance. Mm -hmm. So uh, important here is to realize that um, parts for automotive applications are usually divided into visible parts and parts that are not visible. We'll, talk, we'll, we'll, we'll call them structural parts or inner parts, yes, and because they tend to be large and flat, we also often call them panels, so you go inner panels and outer panels. Outer panels have extra demands in terms of visual appearance, yes, um, in contrast to inner panels where uh, strength aspects may be more important, yeah. Um, uh, right, so this is, um, this is one thing you have to keep in mind. And then uh, we also have a number of parts that are, again, not visible unless you, you cut the, the car up like this, um, which are very high strength, such as, for instance, these impact beams in uh, the doors of passenger cars, yes? Uh, which, which can be made from uh, uh, ultra high strength steels um, with strengths uh, beyond the gigapascal. Okay, so very important with the steels that we apply is that they shouldn't strain harden. So we don't want any yield point elongations uh, when uh, the customer, or the, the car maker, uses them. The other thing we want is to have a high R value. Hmm? And we know that this is related both to uh, the crystallographic texture and the, uh, the composition. Hmm? So if we have, as if I, I want to have a high RM value, mean value of the R, I need to have a very large, uh, so if I would measure this with x-rays, uh, intensity of 111 reflections, yes? Hmm? So which means I have a very strong, uh, very high 111 parallel to normal direction um, fiber, and I also need to have um, a low carbon content. Low carbon content, yes. Um, uh, preferably, if you, if you see here, yes, uh, the R value will be high at around or less than uh, 10 hmm, uh, ppm. So you, you, you want to uh, either use uh, steels that have the vacuum degassed, where you have very, very low carbon contents, and where you bind the, um, the carbon with either titanium or niobium, as a form of titanium or niobium precipitates. Yeah. Or you precipitate it effect efficiently as a carbide. Mm, that's what we do in the aluminum killed low carbon steels, all right? Okay, so a few things here about the, the, the processing hmm, uh, of these, um, these steels. Hmm. Uh, so first of all, we have, 
important parameters in the hot rolling, in the cold rolling and the annealing. Yes? Um, and what are these parameters? Well, the finishing rolling temperature and the coiling temperature. So here we're talking about the aluminum killed low carbon steels, okay? So um, the formability depends on the finishing temperature. If we finish rolling in the hot uh, strip mill at temperatures above the A3 temperatures, so where we have some gamma phase present, yes, uh, we stop seeing an increase in the R value. So rolling in the two-phase region or in the austenite region is not a good idea. Second, uh, the coiling temperature. Here we see that depending on the coiling temperature, yes, we can have high R values or very low R values. And we know that this is related to the precipitation of aluminum nitride hmm, for when we do, in the case of a batch annealed um, cold strip. Hmm. So if you have low, uh, a, a low coiling temperature, the aluminum nitride is in solution. And that, remember, that is what you want to have. Aluminum nitride is in solution. Yeah? So this in solution. Solution. S-O-L. If you coil at high temperature, the aluminum nitride precipitates and doesn't give you the, the texture effect. The ter in case of the cold rolling and annealing, again, what's important is the amount of cold rolling. Yes? The, the peak value of the uh, RM parameter, the Langford value, increases and peaks at around a little over 70% of deformation. So low carbon steel grades don't gain in when you deform them beyond 70%. Okay, so that's an important thing to know um, when you when you are um, uh, deciding, uh, for instance, the hot strip thickness. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is the annealing temperature. Mm -hmm. The annealing temperature. Remember uh, that we discussed uh, batch annealing. Mm -hmm and that the temperatures there were of the order of 700 degrees C. So they're below the A1 temperature. Why is that? If we go beyond the A1 temperature, we introduce um, um, austenite in the microstructure. That has an impact, negative impact on the texture development. And we see, again, a reduction in the formability. All right. Okay. What is important to remember with these steels is they have very simple microstructures. Yes. So the, the properties that we, um, uh, uh, mechanical properties that we have, so the yield strength, tensile strength, and uh, the uh, elongation, yes, are basically uh, controlled by really a few parameters. First of all, very important, as always, is the grain size. Yeah? So uh, we have a whole patch relation for the yield strength. We have a whole patch equation for the uh, tensile strength. And the elongation is pretty much independent of the, uh, the, uh, the grain size. I, 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 we discussed this, that there will be a slight decrease that there will, there will be a decrease. Of course, that's when you reduce the grain size very heavily. In the case of uh, you know, technical situations, um, uh, the grain size, you can't get much lower than um, uh, 10, 15 microns anyway. So um, for all practical purposes, the uh, elongation does not uh, uh, decrease. Then um, we add uh, we can add strengthening elements such as uh, uh, manganese, silicon, and phosphorus. Um, in general, what we see is that, uh, of course, they will increase tensile strength, uh, yield strength, and tensile strength, and there will be a decrease in the uh, uh, elongation. 
And, uh, and then we have the temper rolling. That is another uh, uh, important uh, thing uh, because we always uh, have to do it. Yeah? Uh, and in particular for the uh, uh, aluminum killed low carbon steels, which always contain um, a relatively high uh, uh, amounts of carbon, you have to do the temper rolling to get rid of the uh, yield point and uh, yield point excuse me, elongation. And so as you, the amount of temper rolling yes, will decrease the, uh, the, uh, the yield strength, of course. You will also have a, um, an, a decrease in the uh, elongation. Uh, but the, the tensile strength uh, is, remains unaffected. Hmm? Okay. So again, important, uh, and um, uh, we've discussed this in the past, is that um, is how you process the steels. Yes. If you process them in um, these aluminum killed uh, carbon steels, low carbon steels. If you process them in a uh, batch annealing situation and in a uh, continuous annealing uh, situation, you have very different situations in terms of carbon in solution, yes? In the case of um, the batch annealing, you have near equilibrium conditions. In the case of uh, the continuous annealing, you have to have an overaging step to precipitate as much carbides as you can, hmm? okay? Let me just, okay. So let's um, uh, uh, see typical ranges of uh, elements, important elements in these steels, uh, aluminum killed low carbon steels. These are very, very, very lean compositions. Yes, very lean compositions. Yeah. So we're, um, the carbon contents will typically be in the range of 200 to 500 ppm. Yes. Um, the nitrogen content will, it's smaller than 100, but really the, the, the number you have to remember is typically 40 ppm. Yes. And then we have very important is the aluminum additions. Yes. And they're 200 to 500. Again, typically is uh, about uh, uh, mid-range here, 300 ppm. And then the manganese content is 1,500 to 2,000 ppm, right? These are ppms, all of these. Uh, so that's 0.15 manganese, right? Very low. Hmm? Um, and, and so this is really the composition for the most important batch annealed aluminum killed uh, low carbon steels, okay? Very lean compositions. Okay, so again, what happens with the aluminum nitride is very important in these steels. Yes, um, for reasons, of course, is that uh, you want to uh, eventually bind the aluminum to nitrogen. Yes, uh, but in the case of the batch annealed uh, route, it's also a way to do two things, is to get the good texture and at the same time bind the nitrogen, hmm? okay? So what do we see when we look at the solubility of aluminum nitride in austenite? What do we see? If we have about 100 ppm of nitrogen and about uh, here 370 ppm of aluminum. That's a typical um, uh, composition here. So this is the composition, yes? yes? And this is the solubility line. And so you know that if I have a composition that's above the solubility line, I should have, uh, uh, and, and this is a, excuse me, this is a, the solubility line at uh, 980. So that is in the austenite uh, conditions, yeah, in the austenite uh, stability range. So what should happen is the nitrogen should by and large precipitate as aluminum nitride. Yes? So aluminum nitride should form in the austenite and that's illustrated here. 
but it doesn't. It does not. Hmm? So um, it does not. This is kinetic, uh, kinetically uh, difficult. Hmm? So if you look now, because this is an equilibrium diagram, right? So um, um, uh, whether or not something happens and how fast it happens, you get to see if you plot, as you know, PPT, diag PPT diagrams, right? Um, uh, excuse me, precip PTT diagram, precipitation time temperature diagrams. So um, see, for instance, if I'm here at this temperature, 980, so that would be around here, yes? Yes. The um, uh, precipitation of the aluminum nitride in austenite will take for a very long time. Hmm? See here, over uh, 100 minutes. Yes. So it basically does not occur uh, in the austenite. However, when you, um, as soon as you make ferrite, yes, yes. Um, the precipitation starts. You have very, uh, uh, very uh, effective precipitation of the aluminum in the um, in the uh, in the ferret. And but what is important here is, of course, is the choice of your um, temperature. If your temperature, if you choose to coil at 700 or at 600, yes, you will have I'll have to extend this. You will have enough time in the coiled material, remember that the coiled material cools down slowly, the cooling rate is uh, 20 degrees per hour, yes, so um, you will have plenty of time to precipitate the aluminum nitride in the ferrite, yes. However, if you coil below, uh, say, uh, 500, yes, 50, there, uh, again, the, the, uh, the growth of the aluminum nitride stops because you don't have aluminum diffusion. Okay. The a choice of the coiling temperature does not only influence the um, whether or not aluminum nitride is formed, yes, it also has an impact on the carbides, hmm? the carbides that you form. Now, normally, hmm, uh, if you have 200 to 500 ppm of uh, carbon, so this is here, uh, let's have a look at the f this phase diagram here. Mm -hmm. So this, is two, this point here is 200, and this point here is 500 yes, uh, uh, ppm of, of carbon. So what does that mean? What does that tell you? That, that tells you that normally you should have perlite in the microstructure. Whether or n however, whether or not you have perlite, yes, and how the perlite will look like, or the cementite will look like, depends very much, on, again, on the temperature at which you do the coiling. Hmm? Um, so let's, let's um, uh, discuss this for a moment. So in so if, um, again, we're talking about aluminum killed, low carbon steels. Hmm? Um, so in the, the hot strip mill, you have your reheating, the finishing, the cooling, and the coiling. Yes, And so you have the temperature as a function of position. Hmm? And the graphs here are for a 300 ppm carbon uh, uh, low carbon steel with 0.15 manganese, right? So if you wa wonder where these curves come from. Uh, so you do uh, the deformation, the rough rolling in the austenite stability range, you do the finishing in the austenite, and then you cool down, hmm? and you know in, on the runout table here, you do the transformation. The transformation is very quick, right? This, these steels have, um, um, you can see here, this is, this is your TTT diagram, right? The, trans the, the formation of ferrite is uh, instantly, yeah, very quick. Um, and um, so, so you, you start doing, you, you start getting the transformation here, yes. But, uh, and, and, and then as you coil, yes, you get a very low uh, uh, 
cooling rate. Yes? So the, um, it depends now on how deep you have been cooling. Yes? For instance, if you go um, at 700 degrees C, yes, you have transformed the, uh, you have formed the proeutectoid ferrite, yes, but you're going to cool down and form your cementite in conditions of very, very low and very slow cooling, yes. So in this case, you may not even form any perlite. Yes. And what you, you will get is what we call divorced uh, cementite. And that means that the, the cementite is absolutely not connected to, uh, does not, it forms absolutely no um, uh, cementite, uh, excuse me, perlite. Yeah? Or you can coil deeper, yes, for instance, 600 or lower. And this means that the perlite transformation is done before you do the coiling. In this case, I do the perlite transformation after I'm coiling, and here I do it before I coil, yes? So the distribution of the cementite will be essentially different. And, at, and, and again, also, as I said, if you coil at high temperature, you will precipitate the aluminum nitride. If you coil at low temperatures, you will not precipitate the aluminum nitride, all right? Okay. Um, right, and this is okay, and this is um, a calculation here to show you what happens to the aluminum nitride. So it's basically um, so this line here is the temperature. So I'm, I'm going uh, down in temperature uh, slowly. And I'm, I'm looking at, I'm tracking the radius of aluminum nitride particles. Yeah? And so what is interesting here is, uh, so the temperature goes from around 650 to 520. Okay? And what you see here is that the, in the ferrite, the aluminum nitride particles grow very quickly. But then the growth stops. Hmm? Growth stops at about at about this temperature, yes. And what is the temperature here? Temperature is below 600, yes, below 600. And as a rule of thumb, you can assume that when you're close to 550, all the substitutional elements basically stop diffusing, yes. And if you want to precipitate a particle, a, a carbide, a nitride, what have you. You need two particles, two elements need, need to come together, the aluminum and the nitrogen. Now, nitrogen can diffuse easily at 550, but aluminum stops diffusing. So the particle, the aluminum nitride, cannot grow anymore because the aluminum doesn't diffuse to the particle. Yes? And that's the reason why the, um, uh, uh, so the particle stops growing. The aluminum in solution is now flat, yes? And of course, there will be, if I don't precipitate all the nitrogen, there will be some nitrogen left in solution. Hmm? Hmm? Right, and so, so uh, you, uh, here it says uh, it's a little bit lower uh, than what I said, uh, 520. Um, you effectively don't have any aluminum. Um, the nitride precipitate. So, but that also has a big impact on the um, on the properties of your uh, material in terms of the properties in the length of the the coil. Hmm? Say if you this is a hot rolled coil, yes, and you have uh, outer wraps and inner wraps, yes of this coil. Um, the outer wraps and the inner wraps will um, be um, exposed to higher cooling rates, always. Yes. And um, as a consequence, two things happen. Hmm? Is that um, the carbide distribution is different on these ends and the 
aluminum nitride precipitation is different at the ends. So let's have a look at the precipitation of uh, nitrogen as a nitride, as aluminum nitride, if we coil at high temperature. Yes. Well, what we see is that we precipitate most of it in the center of the coil, but at the, on the inner wraps and the outer wraps, we don't. Yes. Why is that? Well, because the inner wraps, we are coiling, we are coiling on a mandrel, you know, the mandrel of the coiler, and the mandrel is cold. Right? So the strip may be arriving at um, 700 degrees C, but when it touches the, the mandrel, it'll be cooler. It'll be, it'll be much cooler. And so the cooling rates will be faster, and I'm not going to precipitate any aluminum nitride. Yes? And the same at the, um, on the exterior wraps. They're on the exterior, so they, they cool down much faster hmm, than the interior wraps. So my product will, be, will have inhomogeneous properties. Yes? And if you have a demanding customer, it means that you will have to scrap these ends. Yes? Or figure out a way to solve the problem. One of the ways uh, it's solved in practice is by having slightly warmer ends. Uh, so you, instead of um, cooling the, the start, the head and the tail of your strip a lot, as you would do the middle, you reduce the cooling you know, so that they, they're hotter when they and so you can compensate for this. Hmm? Um, of course, if I, do, if I had done the coiling at low temperature, yes, then, then the, this faster cooling rate doesn't really matter, and I have uh, uh, very little nitrogen, aluminum nitride precipitated. Yes? Um, and the other thing, what is very nice, and you can see this uh, already here, is if I have a strong nitride binder, like titanium, titanium, titanium nitride forms, titanium nitride, titanium forms, titanium nitride, at high temperatures already, so there's never any problem for its precipitation, yes? So the, 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 the nitrogen is fully precipitated by the time you are coiling the strip, yes? So that's for the nitrides. What about the, uh, the, uh, the carbides? Well, you can see the difference uh, or the, the, the sensitivity to um, the, the higher cooling rates at the tail end and at the uh, uh, head of the strip uh, if you measure the yield strength. Yes? When, uh, because you have higher cooling rates, so again, this is for a hot band that's coiled at uh, 720, at the head and at the tail, yes, you see higher strength, higher yield strengths, and the reason is because I get finer carbides in the microstructure. Yeah, so um, that is uh, you can already see that that will uh, these inhomogeneities in the strip length w will be an essential uh, problem with uh, aluminum killed low carbon steels. Yes in certain cases for certain processing. Hmm? Because um, obviously, if you, if you were using a low coiling temperatures, um, these effects would be minimized. Yes? But then it means that you would have to go into batch annealing. Hmm? Because for the batch annealing, you must have a low coiling temperature. Hmm? The coiling temperature must have been low. Okay, and, you, and, and the reason is shown here. I, I, I just want to remember, remind you of the fact that there is an optimal, excuse me, um, heating rate in the um, um, batch annealing process where the recrystallization of the microstructure, the colder microstructure, recrystallization kinetics intersects with the 
aluminum nitride precipitates and gives you this pancake microstructure and you know that has a very high formability. Hmm? And so, um, and, and to achieve this, of course, you need to have your aluminum nitride in solution. Okay, and people have studied this uh, process um, and uh, what they see is that the number of grains with the right uh, fiber orientation will increase strongly during the, the annealing, and it's during this very slow annealing. Okay. All right. So um, again, here uh, the this this formability parameter, the R value, hmm, is a strong function of the rolling. Okay, because it's the rolling that gives you the texture. And the, the maximum here hmm, of, uh, for aluminum killed steels is around 70 uh, 70%. Yes? And the minimum is around 50%. Hmm? So uh, because if you, if, if, you, um, if you have less than 50% uh, of deformation, you will get very sluggish recrystallization. Okay? So uh, you basically want to work around this point. Yes. Hmm? Um, it also means that um, if you, you see if you if you need to make one millimeter thick uh, strip for your client, yes, that means that the the way you can control the deformation here, the amount of deformation, is by choosing the right uh, hot strip thickness. And that's, that's, you don't have much choice because you need to have seventy percent of deformation. Yes, okay. You can already see that with IF steels, hmm, um, the, the dependence gives you a lot more possibilities. Hmm. Here, you can increase the um, thickness, excuse me, the, um, the R value by increasing the, the reduction beyond 80%. Yes? Okay? So it also means that you can process uh, thicker thicker gauge hot strip yes so it's in terms of productivity high f steels are um, also uh, interesting what other problems do we have with um, or challenges do we have with low carbon steels well it turns out that um, the carbon gets in the way of the texture formation yes. we uh, when, when we have free carbon in the microstructure, we have, um, we have a problem of texture formation. Yeah? And, and, and we know how to solve this. We basically need to have the carbon uh, has to be precipitated. Yeah? But there is a little hitch. Yes? It's that carbon and manganese have an attractive interaction. Yes? So when you add manganese to a low carbon steel, yes, the precipitation of cementite will be delayed because, because of this attractive interaction between carbon and manganese. Yes, um, the manganese will be kind of kept in solution by the presence of uh, manganese. We call this this combination of substitutional alloying element and interstitial element. Yeah? We call these dipoles. We call them dipoles. And these elements like to stick together. Yes. So as a consequence, what we use, what we see, is that the R value is higher when we reduce the carbon content from say 400 to 70 ppm to 10 ppm yes it increases yes but there is a negative impact from the manganese content yes so when the manganese content increases yes i see a decrease in the r value because this problem okay and and you can see remember um, and the impact of the manganese is uh, most strongly felt. Yes. So uh, typical low carbon steels yes, will have 
uh, as I remember, 200 to 500 ppm of uh, carbon, yes? So that's typically in this range. So the, this will be, this is a correct uh, view of things here for the R dependence on the manganese content. And you can see here the, the lowering decrease is exactly inside the typical manganese range uh, that you have, okay? And people have studied this in detail, um, uh, and you, you, it's actually um, in order to get the, the best uh, combination of properties, um, uh, considering uh, that you have about 200 to 400 uh, ppm of, of carbon, uh, this is the actual range where you can achieve the best possible uh, formability. Again here, uh, I want you to note that in IF steels, yes, it doesn't matter what manganese content you have, yes, the, the R value is high because I don't have uh, carbon in solution, yes, and, um, and, and it's irrelevant what the manganese does to the carbon in this stage, in this uh, grade, because there's basically no carbon in solution. Yes, um, right, and we talked about the, the, the temper mill. So again, this is a, a R value as a function of heating rate. That's basically saying what is the, um, the effect of uh, having a aluminum killed uh, steel processed with low uh, uh, processed with low coiling temperature. So if you have low coiling temperatures, it's, it's best to process this steel during the uh, annealing, recrystallization anneal, with low heating rates because that's where you get the highest R value. Yeah? If you have coiled it at a high temperature, you want to have fast heating rates. You don't need to get uh, slow heating rates. But you see that the best, uh, the best R values are obtained in batch annealing, yes, so low heating rates, and for uh, material that's coiled at low temperatures. Yeah? And that's why there are some companies who for many years have not used continuous annealing technologies because uh, they didn't feel it was worth the investment. Yes? Uh, because you, you can get pretty good uh, formability if you use the batch annealing route. Hmm? All right. Um, let me... Uh, skip this because it's a little bit too technical. Uh, grain size is um, an interesting uh, point. I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about this. In general, you would think that grain size is uh, you know, you'd like to have small grain sizes, basically. But in, in the case of texture development, actually having slight grain growth, yes, is advantageous because the grains that grow, yes, tend to be the ones that have the right texture, yes? Okay, so larger grains means less uh, grains that don't have the right orientation, so uh, you see an increase in the, uh, the, the R value, in the formability. Having said this, is this something you really want to uh, exploit a lot? Not really, because of obviously there will be a decrease in strength, yes? Um, but the other problem is, um, is the following. When you have large grains, yes, and you deform a panel, yes, the grains um, uh, usually when you deform a grain, 
it's, it doesn't remain flat. It starts to uh, um, uh, become wavy. The grain becomes wavy. Yes. Now that's not too bad if you have small grains. That's not very visible. But once the grains start to be large, it gives what's called orange peel effect. Yes. And basically, it's it's like you have uh, a high roughness. It, it basically your surface becomes rougher, and that is um, usually not acceptable when you have a, um, a painted panels because it has an impact on the quality of the visual appearance. Okay, and and uh, in particular for uh, car makers, this is really important. Yes. It doesn't have it doesn't really have a huge impact on strength or anything, but it has a huge impact on the visual appearance of painted panels and, and so and that and that's called um, uh, orange peel and orange peel is usually related to large grains yeah. all right um, good so now um, so we, we've talked about the important things in the case of uh, low carbon steels aluminum kill low carbon steels and I want to remind you of the fact that, so what's important here is the aluminum nitride and the cementite, yes, the cementite precipitation. <coughs> Texture and uh, aging, yeah? there's no, no yield points. And of course, I also want to remind you of the fact that when you precipitate the aluminum nitride, you also get rid of nitrogen in solution, right? And, and so uh, you do get rid of the, um, the, the strain aging that may be caused by nitrogen. Now let's look at our um, uh, IF steels. Uh, IF steels. Now the IF steels are characterized by two important differences if you compare them with the low carbon seal in terms of composition. First of all, they're vacuum treated. Vacuum treated means I have low carbon, right? Not 200 to 500 ppm, but well, th this, is, this is the typical very large range, yeah? 10 to 80. Typically, yes, um, uh, steel makers can go easily less than 10, but there is some pickup and, and things like this, so usually easily less than 20 ppm, yes? In, um, the nitrogen is pretty much the same, around 40 ppm, yes? But what's really important here, the silicon and the manganese is comparable, phosphorus, sulfur is comparable, aluminum is comparable, don't forget we always need to add aluminum, to kill the steel, yes, to, to, to remove the oxygen yes, uh, that we have in excess from, from the steel making. So you still have aluminum in your steel. But what you add is titanium and or niobium. So you, there are different IF steels. You have steels which, where you only add titanium and steels where you add titanium and niobium. Hmm? Um, and what do these do? They uh, they stabilize the, uh, the steels, they, they, they stabilize the carbon and the nitrogen. Hmm? Just a few words here about these IF steels and oh, composition. So you have titanium IF steels, which we write like this, or titanium niobium IF steels. Yeah? It, there's a slightly different uh, concept in the composition here. When you make titanium IF steels, the titanium will form nitrides, it will form carbosulfides, it will form sulfides, and it will form titanium carbide. Hmm? So it takes care of the nitrogen and it takes care of the carbon. And if you can form carbosulfide of titanium, it also takes care of, the, uh, of carbon. And we'll talk about this. In the case of a 
titanium niobium composition, titanium forms titanium nitride, and niobium forms niobium carbide, and that's it. Why would you use one and not the other? Well, usually with titanium, I have steel, we have, an, we have to add an excess of titanium. We add 100, about 100 ppm of excess titanium in order to make sure that titanium carbide is formed, we need to have an excess of titanium. So we add more than is needed from a stoichiometric point of view to stabilize the carbon. Yeah? And it turns out that this can give surface defects. Surface defects in the galvanized, galvanized products. Yes? It can, can give titanium related and typical, these would be oxides, yes, and, um, and so you, you, you don't want this, and so uh, we, um, we use titanium niobium, yes, uh, where we don't have uh, a problem of having to add an excess of titanium or an excess of niobium, yes? And that uh, has... Uh, um, is, is positive for the, the quality. Hmm? Right, um, tensile uh, properties here, it's, these, are, these can be very, very soft materials, yes? Uh, 140 to 180, yes? Uh, but if you don't temper all these materials, you know, it can be as low as 120, yes? Really, really soft materials, yes? Um, very large elongations, yes. High R values, very low delta R values. So these materials are absolutely perfect, yes, for formability, difficult formability uh, situations, yes. Okay, right. We're not going to go into this in very much detail, but. I do want to tell you that um, the formation of these um, carbides and nitrides uh, at first looks rather simple. Uh, it's a bit more complicated than this, yes? And this is illustrated here. The reason why it's a little bit complicated, it's because um, of this, the fact that titanium uh, can form sulfides and carbosulfides. So if, if you look at the precipitation sequence of um, these various titanium precipitates during hot rolling, in the hot rolling process, it's, it's a, a bit complicated. So first, you, the easy thing is the, di the, the ni uh, nitrogen binding. That happens at high temperature, yes? But then this is followed by uh, around 13, 1200 here, by sulfide formation, yes? And if the temperature, and, and so remember, 1200, that's the reheating furnace, yes? If your reheating furnace temperature is a little bit lower, you can form carbosulfide. Now this is an interesting precipitate because it's the only precipitate that, for, that binds carbon at high temperature. Yes? So, um, and so myself and other people have uh, uh, tried to develop steels based on this concept because if you, if you have something that can bind uh, carbon at high temperature, you can easily get rid of carbon this way and very efficiently. However, you need to reduce the reheating temperature to get this uh, precipitation going. So, and that's, that's an issue in terms of productivity. And then as the temperature decreases, you start forming your titanium carbides. Yeah. In the, and it's not finished. In the, if, if you have, for instance, added some, a small amount of phosphorus, because these steels are very soft, 
it, it becomes interesting to add small amounts of phosphorus to these steels to strengthen them, yes? Then what you see is that in batch annealed IF steels, the phosphorus can react with the titanium carbide and the carbosulfides to form iron titanium phosphide, yes? So making the, um, uh, the whole situation a bit more complex. All right, I want to um, close at this point with these IF steels. We'll continue uh, next Tuesday and um, with, with the titanium IF steels.